The stored chemical energy in gasoline is about 42 megajoules per kilogram, if Wikipedia can be believed. I suspect that's probably right. Close enough, right? And it's going to depend a little bit from one gasoline to the next gasoline, but let's go with this number. It's probably about right. And the density of gasoline is about 0.75 grams per cubic centimeter. So if you want to float, um, cover yourself in gas. Maybe light it on fire. Nothing will go wrong. All right, how much energy is released by burning a gallon of gas? So that's what this sort of energy really is. How much do you get out by burning a kilogram of gas? You get 42 megajoules out. So really, this is just a unit conversion. Well, it's a density unit conversion problem. I have to figure out one gallon of gas is how many kilograms of gas. Well, so I've looked up one gallon is 3785.41 cubic centimeters. Right, so using this conversion, I can start with a gallon and figure out how many cubic centimeters that is. Uh, because if I have the mass, one gallon, and I, or sorry, the volume, and I multiply it by the density, 0.75 grams per cubic centimeter, I will get the mass, but notice I have grams divided by cubic centimeter, sorry, gallons divided by cubic centimeter. So I have to put in the unit conversion of 3785.41 cubic centimeters divided by gallon. And while I'm here, notice that's kilograms, this is grams, I'm going to put in another unit conversion of one kilogram per 1,000 grams. So let's just cancel our units to make sure everything works. So gallons, cancel gallons, centimeters cubed, cancel centimeters cubed, grams, cancel grams. Yes, I will get something in kilograms out. So one gallon of gas, I started with the volume, I multiplied by the density, I did a couple unit conversions, the number of kilograms, I have to use my calculator, 2.839 kilograms. Too, too many sig figs, but this is an intermediate number, so I'm keeping extra digits. All right, that's how many kilograms we have. So therefore, the amount of energy released is the mass of gas, 2.839 kilograms, times the chemical energy stored per kilogram. So that's 42 times 10 to the sixth joules. That's what 42 megajoules means per kilogram. All right, kilograms cancel kilograms. I multiply these two numbers together. And I get uh, 120 to two sig figs, 120 megajoules, or uh, 120 times 10 to the sixth joules. Either way of saying it means the same thing. Which means if it takes, remember it takes about 150 uh, megajoules to throw a fastball, so let's throw a curveball. It's about 120 joules, sorry, 150 joules. You could throw a million curveballs with one gallon of gas if you were able to perfectly convert the stored chemical energy into kinetic energy of baseball. Good, all right, so that's how much energy is stored. That was the first question. Now, because this is an intermediate number, I'm actually gonna give extra sig figs. It's really 119.24 megajoules. I'll save that in case I need it later. That's, we've got two sig figs, so that's what I'm writing it to. Next, how, what is mc squared for a gallon of gas? That's not too hard. We already know m, so mc squared is just equal to 2.839 kilograms times C, which is 2.99792 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared. I will get kilogram meters squared per second squared. That's going to be in joules. So if I stick this in my calculator, I get 2.552 times 10 to the 17th joules. That is the mass energy of a gallon of gas, right? So a gallon of gas, you multiply the density, you figure out its mass, mc squared is that. What is the fundamental physics efficiency of burning gas? So remember we define this, fundamental physics efficiency is just equal to um, the energy produced by the mass of the fuel, c squared. Well, I'm doing this a little bit wrong. Because when you burn gas, you also include oxygen. So what that means is when I do the mass of the fuel, I'm only going to include the mass of the gas. I really ought to also include the mass of the oxygen. Um, so to do that, I would actually have to know what gasoline is. It's probably octane. And if I knew what octane was, the chemical formula, I could tell you, I could probably guess 
the chemical reaction. So let's get let's go ahead and guess that because it has oct. You guys probably actually know this, but I don't. Oct. Let's say there's eight carbons, and for each carbon you're going to get two oxygens and probably two more to go with the hydrogens. So let's actually assume that uh, gasoline has eight carbons, a bunch of hydrogens, and we're going to have four oxygens per carbon. So that actually it's a greater mass of oxygen than gasoline that gets burned. Um, eight carbons, four oxygens, really 32 oxygens plus all those hydrogens. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guess, and I will, I will put you in little yellow text how good this is. Guess that gas is octane. And guess, because I don't really know this, that octane has eight carbons in it. And let's guess that the chemical reaction is going to use up four oxygens for each carbon, because you go to CO2 and then probably two H2Os, because you probably have four hydrogens per carbon. I had to guess. And so a carbon plus four hydrogens is 16 uh, nucleons, and oxygen is 16 nucleons. Uh, we'll guess that gas, that four times the mass of the gas is equal to the mass of the oxygen used. So for my mass of the fuel, I'm going to use the mass of the gas times five on the assumption that I burn four times that mass in oxygen in order to burn the gas. Because really this mass of the fuel is not just the gas, but it is also the gas plus the oxygen for this definition. All right, so doing that, so let's see, the numbers I'm going to need, here is the energy produced. Here is the mc squared pre-calculated. Those are the only numbers I need. I'm going to multiply this one by 5, hoping that we're including the mass of the oxygen in it. We'll see. In fact, I'll do it both ways. So um, we'll start by saying if you don't include oxygen, So if you foolishly fail to include the oxygen in the mass of the fuel, then the efficiency you're going to get is the energy produced, 119.24 times 10 to the 6th joules. That's how much energy you get by burning a gallon of gas. And a gallon of gas has this much mc squared divided by 2.552 times 10 to the 17th joules. All right, so that's if you foolishly ignore the oxygen. So if you guess, which is what I'm doing, that the mass of the oxygen is equal to four times the mass of the gas, then M fuel is equal to five times the mass of the gas, including all that oxygen, then we would get an efficiency is equal to 119.24 times 10 to the sixth joules divided by five times 2.552 times 10 to the 17th. And because I've done this guess here, there's no way this one's going to be better than one sig fig. I'm going to put both of those in my calculator. Here I get 4.7 times 10 to the minus 10. And unsurprisingly, this is a factor of 5 smaller at 0.9 times 10 to the minus 10, or 9 times 10 to the minus 11. And those are right in the range that we should expect for the efficiency of chemical reactions. So what this says is, when you burn, really this is the one that's more close to reality, when you burn gasoline, about one ten billionth of the mass of the gasoline plus the mass of the oxygen it reacts with is converted into energy which makes your car go. Now there's another problem here is that the efficiency of extracting energy from gasoline converting that into kinetic energy in the car is not 100%. So if you calculated your gas mileage based on this, you would way overestimate your gas mileage because you haven't taken into account the fact that there's other losses, friction in the engine, and so forth. All right, so that's an example of using this fundamental physics efficiency with chemical reactions. First problem. So first of all, I did go and look it up. Methane does, in fact, have eight carbons. Um, I was assuming... 32 hydrogens, which eh, isn't quite right, 18, whatever. So C8H18, and when you burn it, not methane, octane, when you burn octane, it turns out it takes 50 oxygen molecules together with two octane molecules to make 16 carbon dioxides and 18 waters. 
18 waters. That sounds like uh, you go to the grocery store and get a pallet with bottled water. But no, we're talking 18 molecules of water, which is a lot less. All right, so if you get the mass of this stuff, so this is, when I say gasoline, I'm assuming your gasoline is pure octane, which it's not. Let's just pretend. Um, the mass of these two guys, and you compare it to the mass of this, the oxygen is about 3.5 times as massive as this. I assumed four, so my blathering around in my head actually was not too far off. Um, you know, 3.5 versus four, I was off by, I don't know, 15%, something like that. So, not too bad. So the total mass of the reactants, this is your gasoline, the mass of the reactants is 4.5 times the mass of the gas, if you want to do your efficiency thing. So good. Having cleaned that up from the last problem. Uh, next, suppose you're upgrading your car to operate on hydrogen fusion rather than on burning gasoline. First, I want to say, if you were doing this, you were the most awesome person ever because we don't actually have fusion reactors that can run that don't take more energy to run than we get out. But you say, wait a minute, fusion should get energy out. Well, yes, but there's inefficiencies in the system. And right now, the inefficiencies are so bad that to maintain the reaction, um, the inefficiencies, we use up more energy than we did just to start it. So we don't have little tiny Mr. Fusions that we can use to drive our car. When we do, it will be a new golden age. Everything will be wonderful. I'm hoping that's soon. So, um, but let's, we're pretending now for the time being. So first, what is the mass of a 10 gallon tank of gasoline? That's pretty easy, because in the last problem we calculated one gallon is 28.39 kilograms. So we have, uh, sorry, 2.839, so it's 28.39 kilograms. That's the mass of gasoline that we would have, yay. Problem B, what mass of hydrogen would you need to produce the same energy as this 10 gallon tank of gasoline? Well, all right, so here's what I'm gonna do, is I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sort of go about this the most direct way, and that is, well, let's see how much energy this is, and then we'll figure out how much energy we get here, um, and then I will just compare the two. So let's start, using this number, 42 megajoules per kilogram, the energy produced, with gasoline, right, so we have 28 kilograms of gas, which is a 10 gallon tank of gas. The energy produced is just 42 megajoules per kilogram times 28.39 kilograms, right? So I'll stick that in my calculator. Oh, do you hear, I just got a text. All right, so this is 1192 megajoules, or that's 1.192 times 10 to the ninth joules, that's a gigajoule, check you out. All right, that's how much energy you can produce by burning 10 gallons of gas. And if you do it all at once, that's called an explosion. And that's awesome. How much energy do you get out by burning one hydrogen atom? All right, so the reaction ultimately is uh, MP, 4MP, goes to an alpha particle, so that's a helium nucleus, two protons, neutr two neutrons, plus two positrons, plus two neutrinos. Well, so here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm going to figure out what's the mass of each of these things. Uh, or, you know, what's the mass energy? So the energy in the mass is just mc squared is going to be four times the mass of the proton times c squared. So that's four times 1.00728 amu times, do the unit conversion, 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per AMU, times C squared, 2.99792 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. All right, when I multiply that up, the energy in mass on the left side is, well, from my calculator, 2.005, I better keep a uh, few extra digits here, 2.005112. 0.00511 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. You see why we use MEV, right? Because these numbers are tiny. Okay, that's the mass on the left side of the equation, or the energy, right? The MC squared mass energy. So then on the right side, I want to use a color I haven't used yet. We want to get the energy in mass on the right side. That is equal to the mass of the alpha particle times c squared plus two times the mass of the electron times c squared plus the neutrino is, has such low mass that we don't have to worry about it. So this on the right side, em, is equal to 4.00151 plus 
1.00151 AMU, this is a blobby pen, times 1.66 times 10, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to distribute, right? I'm going to write this as M alpha plus 2ME C squared. So it's 4.00151 plus 2 times 0 0.00055 AMU. Okay. Um, time, all right, so that whole thing times C squared. Well, I have to do the unit conversion. So I'm going to put in 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per AMU. So, so far I have AMU plus AMU. So that's AMU. Multiply it by kilograms for AMU, and I have kilograms. Now I can multiply by C squared. Right, that's this C squared here. 792 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. So I can stick that in my calculator. All right, I made an error with this number. I forgot to square my C. Right, it's MC squared. Squared. Squared, squared, squared. Very important. So there's the squared. Um, when you actually square it, this number comes out to something different. It comes out to 6.0112 oh, oh, one, one, times 10 to the minus 10th joules. Okay, whew, much better. Um, and then, so that's the mc squared of the four protons. And then the mc squared of the alpha particle, i.e. the helium nucleus plus the two positrons, is equal to 5.9716, 9716 5.9716 times 10 to the minus 10th joules. Okay. This mass is less than this mass. The difference is what we get out in energy. So to figure out how much energy we get out, um, the energy produced is equal to um, the total energy we started with, 0.0112 times 10 to the minus 10th, minus the mass at the end, so that's the stuff that didn't get converted, it's still mass, Subtract out 5.9716, 5.9716 times 10 to the minus 10th joules. All right, so let's see, can I do this in my head? Not in my head, can I do it on paper? So that's going to be a 6, I had to borrow, so that becomes 0 minus 1 is 9, I had to borrow, 0 minus 7 is 3, I had to, oh my god, I had to borrow 659, all right, so that's 0 0.0396, if I did that right, so now I'm going to think about it, 0 0.97 plus 0 0.03 is point. Oh, and then uh, 16 plus 96, I'll get 100, and I'll have a leftover 12. Yeah, that's right. So it's 0.0396 times 10 to the minus 10th joules, which is also 3.96 times 10 to the minus 12th joules. Okay, so that is the amount of energy produced in one reaction. That gives us enough to do a number of things. So one thing I could do with that, um, I could calculate the... Um, fundamental efficiency. I didn't ask for this in the problem, but I'm going to do it just as an example. So, in this case, this is the mass of the reactants, four times that. So this is the mc squared of the reactants, because the reactants are nothing other than the p's. We don't have any oxygen to mess with here, because we're not doing chemical reactions. So the fundamental efficiency, which is E produced divided by mc squared, is 3.96 times 10 to the minus 12th joules divided by 6.0112 times 10 to the minus 10th joules, right? And if you calculate that, you get 0 0.0066, which is about 6.6%, right? So that's the efficiency of nuclear fusion. Um, I lied to you, it's 0.66%. It's about 0.7%. Remember I told you in class it was 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2. That's 0.1 to 1. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 0.1 to 1%, 0.001 to 0.01. So that's about right. So that's the fundamental physics efficiency. That's not necessary for this problem, but I thought I'd throw that in there. But what we really care about is a number like uh, this one, 42 megajoules per kilogram. So we can do that now because we know that this many kilograms of hydrogen 4 times 1 AMU times the unit conversion, produces this many joules. So if I say 3.96 times 10 to the minus 12th joules divided by 4 times 1.00728 AMU 
times the unit conversion, 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per AMU, I get 5.92 times 10 to the 14th joules per kilogram, or if I convert this to megajoules per kilogram, it's a factor of 10 to the 6, so I take off 10 to the 6 from that, I get 5.92 times 10 to the 8th megajoules per kilogram. In other words, whoa, hydrogen fusion is way more efficient. 42 versus 6, 10 to the 8th. Yay. Anyway, now, all right, so what I did, this is, this is the energy produced in one of these fusion reactions. This is the mass of fuel, all the stuff on the left side, mass of reactants. So I divide those to figure out the megajoule per kilogram. That's that number that we were given for gasoline. Now that I know this number, and now that I know I need to make this many joules, I can figure out how many kilograms I need. So if I take the energy that I need, and I divide it by the amount of energy per kilogram, I can figure out how many kilograms of hydrogen. So I need 1.192 times 10 to the ninth joules, divided by 5.92 times 10 to the 14th joules per kilogram gives me 2.0 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms or 2 milligrams. So if you convert your car to one on hydrogen fusion, you can replace 10 gallons of gasoline, right? Burn that shh, with 2 milligrams of hydrogen if you actually had something that could do this effectively, which we don't have the technology to. That's pretty impressive, right? Two milligrams. In part C, we go completely nuts. See, it says, let's go completely nuts. You no longer want to futz around with mere nuclear fusion. Two milligrams of hydrogen to power your car, you get like 300 miles on two milligrams, milligrams of hydrogen. Sorry, I lost control. You no longer want to futz around with mere nuclear fusion but you want to power your car by using matter, antimatter, annihilation. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What total mass of hydrogen plus antihydrogen would you need in order to produce the same energy as a 10 gallon tank of gasoline? Well, eh, here the energy produced, remember the efficiency is one, is just mc squared. The energy produced, you convert all of your mass to energy when you do matter, antimatter, annihilation. So that's just E equals mc squared, well, we have the amount of E we need, so E over C squared is equal to the mass you would need of matter plus antimatter to get this. So we can just do this pretty straightforward. Um, 1.192 times 10 to the ninth kilogram meter squared per second squared, because that's what a joule is, divided by 2.99792 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and I'm not going to forget to square it. And we get 1.3 times 10 to the minus 8 kilograms, or 13 nanograms, of matter plus antimatter to drive your car as far as you drive it today on a 10-gallon tank. All right, there you go. So, really, examples of playing around with different kinds of energy generation and thinking about E equals mc squared as a way of dealing with nuclear reactions, but also pointing out how much more efficient nuclear reactions are in terms of what mass of fuel is necessary to produce how much energy. And the third problem, a type 1a supernova is a thermonuclear explosion of a white dwarf star. A white dwarf star has 1.4 solar masses of carbon. Very quickly, all of it fuses up to iron. What I mean is all the carbon undergoes nuclear fusion. Now you're left over with iron. Or something very close to the binding energy of iron. Details are under the rug releasing all of the energy in a massive explosion. So what I'm saying is, it's a thermonuclear bomb one and a half times the mass of the sun. I want one. I have legitimate uses for it. Fine, based on just this information and the binding energy curve shown in class, estimate the total amount of energy released in a type 1a supernova. Okay, so here's what, we have 1.4 solar masses of carbon, and we're gonna fuse it to 1.4 solar masses of iron. And the question is, how much energy is released? Well, what we're going to use is the binding energy. So remember, the binding energy, uh, bing, that's supposed to be binding, so being, whatever. 
Um, the binding energy is defined as the number of protons times the mass of the proton plus the number of neutrons times the mass of the neutron uh, plus, um, uh, sorry, minus the mass of the actual thing all times c squared. Okay, now I'm going to do an approximation here. You know that the proton and the neutron have approximately the same mass, right? Uh, they're different by a little bit, but um, we're not going to do better than, say, one significant figure out of this problem anyway, so I'm just going to replace this with n times the mass of one nucleon. So this is both no protons and neutrons together, and that's one nucleon. So this is the same as the binding energy equation. I've just lumped the protons and the neutrons together, pretending they have the same mass. Okay, so what that says is that um, what we want to consider is here, this is going to have some total mass of the carbon white dwarf, and this is going to have the mass of the iron, uh, we'll call it the iron white dwarf, although it's no longer a white dwarf because it is blasted apart. Okay, here's the thing I want you to realize. Um, in this white dwarf, either before or after, we're gonna have, I'm going to find lowercase n is the number of total nucleons. All right, so 1.4 solar masses of carbon. Well, it's going to have an even number of protons and neutrons because carbon-12 has, each one has six protons and six neutrons. Figure out the mass of one carbon, divide it, figure out how many carbon atoms you have. You have 12 times that many nucleons. Or here, figure out the mass of iron, divide it, you have, you have 56 times that many nucleons. So you have the same total number of nucleons. All that happens when you do fusion is you rearrange the nucleons. And some of the neutrons turn into protons or vice versa. In this case, some of the protons will turn into neutrons. Um, that's why I'm talking about nucleons, not protons and neutrons separately. But the thing that is important here is the total number of nucleons, n, is the same in both cases. So what do I do with this? Well, I want to play with this equation a little bit first. I'm going to divide both sides by n. So I have binding energy per nucleon. Why did I do that? Well, because that's what's on the table. It's a binding energy per nucleon. It's equal to the mass of the nucleon minus the mass of whichever element you're talking about divided by n times c squared. And now I'm going to multiply both sides by this n. So I have n times the binding energy. And we'll think about this is in the case of the white dwarf. So this n here is 12 because it's still carbon. So this is the binding energy of carbon. This is the number of carbon. That's the total number of nuclei, which is the same each time, is equal to n number of nuclei times the mass of one nucleon times c squared minus little n over big N times the mass of one carbon atom times c squared. Well, let's think about this for a moment. Little n over big N times the mass of one carbon atom. This here is actually the mass of the carbon white dwarf. Why? Because the mass of one carbon atom divided by the number of nucleons in a carbon atom um, I'm sorry. Well, okay. Yes, it is. It's the mass of the white dwarf because uh, the mass of one carbon atom divided by the number of nuclei in the carbon atom gives you how much mass you have per nucleon, right? So you divide by 12. I have the mass of the white dwarf divided by 12. But there's also 12 nucleons. I multiply by the number of nucleons, which is going to be the number of carbons, also divided by 12. That divided by 12 will go away. Um, sorry, the number of carbons times 12. So I'm dividing by 12. This here, I mean, this actually, what it is, is n is equal to, um, well, nc is 12. So n is equal to 12, the number of nucleons in a carbon atom, times the number of carbon atoms that you have in the white dwarf. That'll give you the total number of nucleons. So you multiply the mass of one carbon times this, total nucleons divided by nucleons in a carbon, times the number of carbons. That's the mass of the carbon white dwarf. This is the mass of an actual legitimate carbon nucleus. So that's the mass of the carbon white dwarf. Well, this is great because I could do the same damn thing with iron. So I'm going to do the same damn thing with iron. I have N times E bing times C divided by N F E. Okay. This N is the same as that. I argued that before. The total number of nucleons doesn't change in the fusion. They're just rearranged and some neutrons are turned into the protons. So this N is the same times m n c squared, right? So this is exactly the same as that. That's different. Minus n over n f e times m. So this was the mass of carbon, of one carbon. This is the mass of one iron times c squared. Well, okay, the number of nucleons 
divided by the number of nucleons in one iron atom is the number of iron atoms. The number of iron atoms times the mass of one iron atom is the mass of, what did I call it, MFEWD. It's the mass of the um, mass of the thing when it's done fusing of all the iron together. That's pretty cool. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this minus this. If I subtract those two equations, why am I doing this? Well, you'll see in a moment. Um, this minus this, by the way, this should have been E binding Fe. Sorry about that, because I was talking about iron for this whole bottom equation here. On the left side, this minus this, I will have the number of nucleons times E binding Fe divided by the number of nucleons in iron, which is 56, minus N times E binding of carbon per nucleon, so that's 12. But here's the thing, binding energy per nucleon, that's something we have on the table. On the right side, this and this just subtract each other out. I'm subtracting this, so that negative will become positive. I have N, or really, yeah, let's write it like this, MCWDC squared minus MFEWDC squared. Look at the right. This is the total mass of the thing before the fusion. This is the mass of the thing after the fusion. What's the difference? Well, the mass before minus the mass I after times C squared is the amount of mass converted to energy. This is exactly the energy released. That's why I did this. Right, so where I started with this knowing that the binding energy tells me what's the mass once I subtract off the mass of nucleons. Well, the mass of nucleons is going to be the same in the both because they're the same number of nucleons, the both. That sounds stupid. Same number of nucleons. What's different is the binding energy, right? how the nucleons were arranged. So the binding energy has got to encapsulate this. So I thought, okay, what I really want to get at, I was trying to get towards this, a difference in the mass of the carbon white dwarf minus the iron white dwarf, because that, I know, is the energy released. How much mass is converted to energy? That difference, the final mass minus the initial mass times c squared. Great, and so I, I worked with this until I could get that in the right form, and I've got it like this. So having done that, I'm going to erase this over here. And I can say that the total energy released in the supernova is equal to the number of nucleons in this thing times the binding energy per nucleon of iron minus the binding energy of carbon per nucleon. So these two things I can look up, and I will do so. Okay, so we're looking at this binding energy curve. And we need to just read a couple of values off the graph. This would be so much easier if we had the table to look it up in, but we don't. So we're going to try this. So we're going to start by making a mess. We're going to start by trying to interpolate here. And I'm going to go straight over to the left. Hey, check that out. Okay, so that's going to be the value per, for carbon. And then we say it fuses all the way up to iron. So we've got iron here on the graph as well. So I'll click on iron. And I will go over to the left. Boop. Okay. And so now what I have to do is figure out what are these two values I write off. I'm going to be really anal about this. And I'm going to go ahead and measure the number of pixels on the graph so that I do as well. I mean, here, I'm going to look at this. Between 7 and 8, let's call it like 7.6. All right. That's probably what I would call it looking at that. Maybe 7.7. .7. It looks like 7.7. .7, but if we're really anal, I'm going to measure the number of pixels from 7 to 8 is 66 pixels. And the number of pixels from here to this line is 44. And now you can do that in my head. 44 over 66 is 2 thirds. So we've got 7.67, right? I guessed pretty well. This, I would say, is probably 8.8. .8. So 7.67, remember that number. I'll use that in a moment. 7.67. And then here, the distance on the graph, measuring from 8 to 9, is 65. So it should be about the same. Yeah, 65 pixels. And the distance from 8 to... Um, it would be so much easier if I knew what I was doing. The distance from 8 to, to this line is 51, and I can't do that in my head. So 51 divided by 65 is 0.78. So we have 7.67 and 8.78 MeV per nucleon. Those are the two numbers we're going to use. All right, having done that, for iron, I have this is uh, 8.78. And for carbon, I have that this is 7.67, in both cases MeV. 
All right, that's very good. I have those two numbers. What is n? So let's come up with an estimate of n. Well, we have 1.4 solar masses. Basically, what I'm going to take is that the n is going to equal the mass of the total thing divided by the mass of the nucleon. Now you say, wait, but the binding energy makes the mass of the total thing different. Yes, okay, but for fusion it's going to be different by 1%. So this will still be good to two significant figures, and we only have two significant figures. So I'm going to briefly ignore the binding energy in order to figure out the number of nucleons. So it's 1.4 solar masses, and I'll, let's go ahead and convert that to kilograms. It's 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms per solar mass. And then the mass of one nucleon is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. All right, so I can do that calculation. 1.68 times 10 to the 57. Right, your carbon white dwarf. 1.4 times the mass of the sun has 10 to the 57 nucleons, all in carbon atoms there. That gives us everything we need to calculate this released energy. The released energy is the number of nucleons, which is 1.68 times 10 to the 57 times the difference in the binding energies per nucleon is the energy released per nucleon. So number of nucleons times energy released per nucleon is 8.78 MeV minus 7.67 MeV, all right? That calculates out to 1.86, see it looks like a palindrome, 10 to the 57 MeV. Let's convert this to joules because that's the number I gave you to compare it to. So we know that there are 1.609 times, is it 1.609 times, I think that's right. 1.609 times 10 to the minus 19th joules in an EV, but that's an MeV. So what I'm going to do to convert this from MeV to EV, I'm going to multiply this by 10 to the 6. So 57 plus 6 is 63. So 10 to the 57 MeV is 10 to the 63 EVs, right? I just turned that from MeV into EV. And so now I have something that I can calculate. Should have been 1.602. And I get... Uh, two two sig figs, three times ten to the forty four joules. Probably, I mean, I've probably made enough approximations that I'm really good to one sig fig. All right. So what I did, I started. I know the total amount of stuff we have. I know that it's been converted from carbon to iron. I said, how many nucleons are there in here? That many, by just taking the mass of the total thing divided by the mass of the nucleon, and knowing that the binding energy will make me wrong by maybe one percent. So I'm good to two sig figs. And then saying, as I rearrange from here to here, the difference in the mass will be released as energy. The difference in the mass is encapsulated in this binding energy. What I have was binding energy per nucleon. So if I take binding energy per nucleon when it's all iron minus binding energy per nucleon when it's all carbon, that difference times the number of nucleons is the amount of energy released. I've worked that out thinking more basically, but, you know, it comes down to that. And I get 3 times 10 to the 4, 44 joules, and what I told you was observationally, supernova of this sort release something like 10 to the 44 joules. Yay! It looks like this is part of why we think we understand these supernovas. The basic energetics of it give us the right amount of energy to what we see coming out. And that's why we think, hey, these are white dwarfs exploding. That's the third problem. In one year, the USA uses about 9 times 10 to the 19th joules of energy. That's way less than one supernova, and that's a good thing, because we don't have nearly as much energy as a supernova to use. Okay, what mass of chemical fuels is necessary to provide this power to the USA, assuming it's provided entirely from burning coal and gasoline and such? Well, here's what we know. Um, chemical fuels. That the efficiency is typically about 10 to the minus 10, and that efficiency is the E produced divided by mc squared. Well, E produced is that, right? That's how much energy we have to produce. We want to find m. Hey, let's just solve this for m. So mass is going to equal E produced divided by 10 to the minus 10 times c squared. Hey, I can do that. So that is 9 times 10 to the 19th joules divided by 10 to the minus 10 times 2.99, you know what? I don't have enough sig figs here to go so nuts. 3.00 times 10 to the 8th 
meters per second squared. And the other thing is now I can do it in my head. Because what is 3 squared? 9. What's 9 divided by 9? 1. So this is 9 times 10 to the 19th divided by 10 to the minus 10 times 9 times 10 to the 16. And then I have joules and I have meters per second squared. So this is going to come out to kilograms because the meter, sorry, meter squared per second squared also in the joules. So this I can do in my head because the 9 cancels the 9. 19 minus 16 is 3. All right, 10 to the 19th divided by 10 to the 16th is 10 to the 19 minus 16, which is 10 to the 3. So this is about 10 to the 13 kilograms equals 10 trillion kilograms of coal and gasoline and such. It has to be burned every year in order to produce um, in order to produce all the energy that the U.S. uses. Is that a lot? What do you compare this to? Well, it's a lot less than the mass of the Earth. Let's think about a person. How many people would you have to burn? I'm not recommending this, but let's say how many people would you have to burn? Well, the mass of the person is about um, 75 kilograms. So if instead of burning coal, we burnt people. Um, 10 to the 13 kilograms divided by 75. You know what? Let's go with heavier people, 100 kilograms. Let's pretend we had that many. So we have 10 to the 2 kilograms. That's 10 to the 11th people, which is 100 billion people. So in other words, every year, to produce the amount of energy that the United States uses, if it comes entirely from fossil fuels, chemical reactions, okay, methane, coal, gasoline, all that stuff, we have to burn the equivalent of, say, 15 times the mass of humans on the Earth. That's a lot. Okay, let's call that a lot. But what we really want to compare it to is nuclear fuels. So let's do nuclear fuels. In particular, H fusion. And we know for H fusion, because we did this in our earlier problem, that the efficiency is 0.007. Good to one sig fig. So now we can do the same thing. So we have 0.007 is equal to E produced divided by the mass of the fuel times C squared. So the total mass of hydrogen you would need in this case is E produced divided by 0. Oh, by the way, this 10 trillion wasn't just um, coal. There was also the uh, oxygen is included in this 10 trillion. So actually, it wouldn't be 15 times. It will be a couple times the total mass of people we'd have to burn every year to produce our energy. But it's worth it because we have to drive our cars. OK, so E produced um, uh, divided by C squared. So here we have the same thing. 9 times 10 to the 9th joules is kilogram meter squared per second squared divided by 0 0.007 times C squared is 9 times 10 to the 16th meter squared per second squared. I squared C like that. So this is going to equal, sorry, that's not, yeah, 9 times 10 to the 9th, not 9 times 10 to the 9th, 9 times 10 to the 19th. We use a lot of energy. So that's 10 to the minus 3 divided by 0 0.007 um, I can, I'm not going to try and do that in my head. I'm going to point out though that this was 10 to the plus 3, right? 10 to the plus 3, you get about 140,000 kilograms of hydrogen. That sounds like a lot if you're thinking about, I don't know, carrying stuff. But that's a lot less than 10 to the 13th. In fact, 140,000 kilograms of hydrogen, oh... Uh, well, let's think about seawater, for example. Um, seawater, water, not seawater, just water. Um, the, if, if suppose we were able to take the hydrogens off of water, the, uh, the mass of hydrogen, or the mass of water that, that you would need, because so H2O has 16 in the O and one in each of the H's, is 18 divided by two, right? Because you have a total mass of 18 divided by two. If I'm, so I multiply this uh, 140,000 by nine, we get 1.3 million. Um, kilograms of water. So what, what I'm saying is um, 1.3 million kilograms of water 
to get this much, this many, 140,000 kilograms of hydrogen, we'd have to start with 1.3 million kilograms of water and toss out all those oxygens, because we don't use oxygen for anything on our planet, so we'll just throw them away. And uh, great, well, the density of water, you know, is equal to one gram per cubic centimeter. I'm hoping you know that. And let's convert the units. There's a thousand kilograms per gram. And there are one meter per 100 centimeters. There are 100 centimeters in a meter right, squared. So am I doing this right? Nope, I'm not, because the grams aren't going to cancel. Because there's a thousand, there's one kilogram and a thousand grams. <laughs> it's not a thousand kilograms and a gram, so it's a kilogram. So this is 100, so it's 10 to the 6th divided by 10 to the 3 um, kilograms per cubic meter, which is 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so this says, this is about, if I divide this by 10 to the 3, I get 1,300 cubic meters of water. And that's maybe something you can start to think about. 1,300 cubic meters of water. One cubic meter is like this, by this, by this. And we need about 1,300 of those. That's probably only a couple swimming pools worth, right? Um, I'll look up the typical volume of a swimming pool. But I'm guessing it's only a couple or maybe a few swimming pools worth of water. If we could do hydrogen fusion, we could power the entire United States for a year, and we get all this fun oxygen out to do fun things with, like, um, I don't know, if you guys can think of any reason we want to my oxygen, we'll, we'll, we'll use it for that. And the other thing is we'll produce a whole bunch of helium, which is good for balloons and talking high. Great. Finally, what mass of combined antimatter matter would be necessary to provide all the energy for the U.S. if somehow we had a source of antimatter, which we don't. So I'm going to summarize our results up here. Chemical fuels, which is not too different from what we do right now. Of course, there's some solar power and wind power and even some nuclear power right now, fission power. It was 10 to the 13 kilograms of fuel that we use plus oxygen. Um, hydrogen fusion, it was 140,000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the 5 kilograms, right? It's a big win. We should get rid of this green pen. It's too blobby. 10 to the 5 kilograms. And finally, let's do the matter-antimatter conversion because that's the easiest one because for matter antimatter the efficiency is one all of the mass is converted to energy and that's equal to the E produced divided by the mass of the fuel so that's matter plus antimatter C squared so we have protons and antiprotons or hydrogen and antihydrogen so the mass is just E produced divided by C squared so we can do that. That's 9 times 10 to the 19th joules divided by 9 times 10 to the 16th meter squared per second squared to C squared is 10 to the 3 kilograms. So we would only need, so matter plus antimatter, we would only need 10 to the 3 kilograms to power the U.S. for a year. Here's another thing to think about, though. What this means is that however we're doing it every year, to, to produce the energy that we use, somewhere we're converting a thousand kilograms of mass to energy. We're really doing this every year. The mass of the Earth, well, it depends where the mass goes. This much mass gets converted into energy. What form of energy? Some of it will turn back into mass, probably. But uh, a lot of it's going to be radiated away as heat, ultimately. Gone. We're losing mass. So, if you want a weight loss program, just do energy. Oh, never mind. I'm done. I'm done for this week. We're not going to talk about weight loss. That's ridiculous.